Hi kids, here's a story about civil defense. Operation Survival. Alert today, alive tomorrow. Since time began, there have always been dangers to threaten men, and men have always sought ways to protect themselves. The early cavemen used natural shelters as a protection against storms, wild animals, and foes. Western settlers banded together to repel Indian attacks. A storm cellar has always been a haven against tornadoes. When traffic became a danger, police began to regulate it. We have fire drills and the best firefighting equipment. Now, with new dangers added to the old, we must learn new methods for our protection and survival. Here is a story about Jim and Sally and how they found out that being alert today can mean being alive tomorrow. Jim and Sally lived with their mother and father near the town of Centerville. Hurry up, Jim. It's almost time for Uncle Harry to be here. I'm hurrying. Boy, I can't wait to show him the boat I built. I'll bet he'll be surprised. Your mother said I'd find you kids down here. Uncle Harry! How do you like my new boat, Uncle Harry? A fine job, Jim. She looks sleek and streamlined enough to turn into a real rocket and take off. Boy, wouldn't that be something? I wish we could hear your lecture tonight, Uncle Harry. It would be just for the men's club. Could you show us some of your colored slides before you go? I don't see why not. Help me put up the screen, will you, Mom? Uncle Harry's going to show us some of his slides. A sneak preview, eh? Sure is, Dad. Grab yourself a front seat. And now, may I introduce the famous war hero and world traveler, the renowned Harry Hobson. Mr. Hobson has recently returned from a globe-encircling tour, and he will show you pictures that will not only interest, but astonish you. A number of slides are shown of Harry's travels. Now here's one of the Great Wall of China. It was built about 2,000 years ago and was over 2,500 miles long. Think of it, the distance between Chicago and San Francisco. The wall was built to protect China from the wild tribes to the north. This picture is of the ruins of the ancient Italian city of Pompeii. The city was destroyed back in the year 79 AD by an eruption of Mount Vesuvius. That's a volcano in the background. Hundreds and hundreds of people were killed. If the city fathers of Pompeii had had a modern disaster plan with an adequate warning system, many people might have been saved. This castle is typical of the strongholds that were built in Europe in feudal times. The castle was a vital place of refuge when dangers threatened. When an enemy invaded the land, the whole community went inside the castle walls. Surrounded by a moat filled with water and with the drawbridge raised, the defenders could withstand a long siege. Here's what happened to a town in Eastern Europe just a few months ago. A sudden shift of wind sent a forest fire roaring into this town. There was a heavy loss of life and property damage. An alert local government geared for fast, efficient emergency action would have made a big difference Speaking of preparedness, I saw many types of underground structures like this in Sweden. These people are ready if disaster strikes, whether it's a natural disaster or enemy attack, and their chances of survival are naturally greatly increased. I hate to interrupt, Harry, but it looks like we're in for a bad storm. I think we'd better leave before it gets any worse. The men's club would never forgive me if the chief after dinner speaker turned up late. Okay, Paul. You certainly had more than your share of rain up here. I'll say, that downpour ten days ago saturated the land to the north. 
and the rains since have sent a lot of the brooks and creeks over their banks. Any danger of the river flooding? After all, those streams feed into it. We're okay as long as the dam at Hanford holds. It's being watched, and everything seems all right, but with this added rainfall, I don't know. I simply must finish that letter to Grandmother before I start cooking dinner. Turn on the TV, will you, Jim? The weather forecast is heavy rains continuing through the night and into the morning. Flooding conditions are reported along streams north of town. A severe strain is being put on the Hamford Dam, where the river water is rising at an alarming rate. We switch you to our mobile unit station at the dam. A crack has developed in the wall of the dam due to the pressure of the flooded waters, and a civil defense warning has been issued. All persons living in low-lying areas along the river are advised to evacuate to higher ground immediately in case the dam should break. We repeat the CD warning. All persons living in low-lying areas. My boat! We've got to pull her up to high ground. Grab your raincoat, Sally, and come on! Jim! Sally! What on earth are they doing out in this weather? The rope's breaking! I've got it! Sally does manage to grasp the end of the rope, but she is off balance. Oh! Hold on, Sally! Get rid of that raincoat! Make for the bow! Meanwhile, Sally and Jim's mother, they never should have gone out in a storm like this. Something's happened. It's breaking. The Hanford Dam is breaking. Oh no! And you get... You're all right now. I can't start the motor. Jim, look! The dam is broken. Abandoning the motor, Jim gets out the oars. But before they can reach shore, the full torrent of water released by the broken dam bears down on the boat. The small boat is flung downstream. Back in Centerville, Mayor Brown is directing the city's emergency disaster plan. Emergency instructions are given to the people over sound trucks driving through the streets. But daylight gives way to the blackness of night, and Jim and Sally are still not picked up. Toward dawn, we can go to that house and see if, if I can get us to shore. Made it! Let's pull the boat up and head for the house. The chances are the people who live here have been evacuated, but maybe we can find something to eat. I'm starved. Just as I thought, nobody's around. I guess they won't mind if we stay here. The refrigerator isn't working. The power lines are down. The food in there is probably okay. Food doesn't spoil without refrigeration until after 36 hours. But there's no sense in taking a chance. Maybe these folks have an emergency food supply like we have in our shelter at home. Jim, look, they do have a shelter. Let's hope they haven't overlooked the food department. The shelter is outfitted with a seven-day supply of emergency food and water, battery-powered radio, flashlights, blankets, first aid kit, and the other essential supplies. Boy, it is well equipped. Now let's eat. Get busy with a can opener, will you, Sally? I can't work one very well. I cut my hand on the oar lock last night. Jim, why didn't you say something? I'll bandage it. Hey, that's a neat job, sis. I guess you didn't take that Junior Red Cross first aid course for nothing. And I can say the same thing about that Red Cross life-saving course you took. If it hadn't been for that, I don't know what might have happened when I fell into the river. A few moments later, does that taste good? I'll say, we can thank our lucky stars. This family was prepared for a disaster. 
I only hope Mom and Dad aren't too worried about us. Scarcely able to keep their eyes open, Jim and Sally roll up in blankets and are soon asleep. Jim begins to dream. Sally, we're taking off. My boat has turned into a real rocket. Whee! Those planes. Maybe they're enemy bombers. Maybe the radar screens have picked them up or they've been reported by the Ground Observer Corps. But we've got to get back with a warning. Jim and Sally speed over a large city. Warning of the coming attack must have been given, Sally. They're taking action in Middle City. Some of those people will be coming out to our town. There's our house. We'd better land. Dad! There goes the take cover signal. Get into the shelter, quickly! Thank goodness you children are back. Switch on the radio, Jim. Attention, please. This is a national emergency. The Air Force has announced that enemy aircraft are approaching this community. An attack is imminent. Go to the nearest available shelter and stay there. This is not a test. This community may be under enemy air attack within minutes. Go quickly but calmly to the nearest shelter. Take a portable radio and emergency food with you, if possible. Obey your authorities. Further instructions will come to you at 640 or 1240 on your radio dial. This station is now leaving the air. Keep your radio tuned to 640 or 1240. Time passes. We've been here for hours and I haven't heard any bomb explosions. Let's go out and see what's happened, if anything. We stay right here until we get an all clear. Bombs could have fallen on a target area many miles off. We still might be in danger of radioactive fallout. Just what is this fallout anyway, Dad? Fallout is what we call the radioactive particles in the mushroom cloud when an H-bomb explodes near the Earth. When an atomic or hydrogen bomb is exploded close to the ground, thousands of tons of Earth and rock are turned into pieces as small as dust. These small pieces are sucked upward in a great mushroom cloud, sometimes to a height of 80,000 feet or more. The particles are then made radioactive and fall back to Earth over a wide area. They can be carried great distances. For instance, if you are as much as 200 miles downwind from the scene of such an explosion, you can be exposed to the dangers of radioactive fallout that's roughly the distance between Washington and New York. The only way to find out if an area has been made dangerous from radioactive fallout is to use special instruments that will react to radioactivity. Here are some pictures of them. This is a Geiger counter. This is a medium range gamma survey meter. This is a high range beta gamma survey meter. These survey instruments measure the degree of radioactivity present in an area. Just as the needle on the speedometer shows how fast a car is traveling, the indicator on these instruments tells how much radioactivity there is. Now if you happen to be in an area that had been made radioactive by fallout, you would need to know how much radioactivity you yourself had absorbed. There is another instrument that measures this. It's called a dosimeter. The dosimeter could be compared to the mileage counter on a car, which tells how far the car has gone. The dosimeter tells how much radioactivity you have taken in or absorbed. Wow, they sure got things figured out. How soon can we leave the shelter, Dad? Not until we get word that it's safe. Radiological monitoring teams, using the instruments showed you, will first make sure whether or not there is evidence of fallout present. We may have a long wait. It's cold in here. Why or why did we forget to bring the blankets? Listen. Attention, please. This is a civil defense bulletin. We have been informed that attacking aircraft have been driven from the area. Sally, the enemy planes have turned back, but we can't get out yet. Dad says we have to wait until... Enemy planes? What are you talking about? 
There aren't any enemy planes. And Dad isn't here. You must have been dreaming. Dreaming? Yipes. So that was it. Now I remember. The flood. Landing on the island. Come on, Sally. Let's go and see what's going on above. Jim, there's a helicopter. We gotta get their attention. Wave your arms. They're turning. They see us. They'll signal for somebody to come and get us. Word is flashed by the pilot of the helicopter, and a rescue boat heads for the island. Jim, we're going to be rescued. A few minutes later, on reaching the mainland, Jim and Sally are directed to a bus to be taken to temporary lodging. We've got to notify Mother and Dad. They'll be sick with worry over us. Everywhere they look, emergency units are hard at work. They arrive at temporary lodging. What do you know? We're back at school. Their names are taken at the registration desk. Can we get in touch with our parents? We'll do our best. First, we need to know a little something about you. Name, address, father's name. They are given food by Red Cross and welfare workers. Golly, this sure looks good. I wonder where all this food and things come from. I could tell you, Jim. Hi, Mr. Mayor. What are you doing here? Well, Sally, this is part of my job. It's the responsibility of your city's government to be ready to meet any type of disaster. You can see Centerville's disaster plan in action now. Boy, it must take an awful lot of time to work out a disaster plan. It does, Jim. But with the help of my civil defense coordinator, the heads of the various city departments, the local Red Cross, and other community organizations, we figured out exactly what our community resources were, so we would know what was available if disaster struck. Right here in Centerville, our Red Cross chapter is responsible for providing food, clothing, and lodging for our disaster victims. But what about all those homes that were washed away and damaged, and all the furniture that was ruined? In cases where families are unable to replace their own belongings, the Red Cross stands ready to assist to rebuild and repair their work. What would we do if we were attacked? Well, Jim, we certainly hope Centerville will be ready. We decided what community preparedness we would need in natural and enemy-caused disasters, and it's the job of our civil defense coordinator to work out the details of the plans. Later. Hey, Jim, your mother and father are here looking for you and Sally. What? Mom, Dad, thank heaven you're both safe. Don't ever go off like that again. You had us worried sick. Finally, the emergency is over. It's good to be back home again. I'll say. Hey, Sally, let's go check out the supplies in the cellar. I'll be with you in a minute, Jim. First, I want to write and thank the people on the island. Gee, I don't know what would have happened to us if they didn't have the food and things. What are you two up to? We're taking a few more supplies down to the shelter. After what Mayor Brown told us, we really want to make sure we're prepared. Try your hand at this puzzle and see how much you know. Civil Defense Plan. Three, first aid and home emergency preparedness. <laughs>